Well, hello, people of God. It's good to be with you and to open God's Word together once again. I want to look together today at 1 Thessalonians and just read the first chapter of 1 Thessalonians, and we'll think a little bit about this book and its background. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, and this is God's own word. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of, Thessalon- of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Uh, so this is the, the word of God from First Thessalonians. Um, it's a wonderful book that we had the privilege of considering in our way through uh, in, a, in, a, in a dedicated and extended way through a sermon series not too long ago in our church. But just as a reminder of uh, what's going on in the book of Thessal- uh, Thessalonians, uh, Thessalonica was a city located in Macedonia. So um, it was on the Gulf of Salonica, which today uh, is called the Thermaic Gulf or the Macedonian Gulf. But it's in the n- northwest corner of the Aegean Sea. And Thessalonica was a port city. It was an important industrial center. It was a capital of one of the provinces of Macedonia. Um, So it was a very important city in Paul's time. Uh, We also know that there was enough of a Jewish population there that there was a Jewish synagogue in the city. So there was not only a Gentile but also a Jewish presence in that city. Uh, We know that Paul founded the church in Thessalonica during his second missionary journey. So Paul's second missionary journey was around 50 A.D. to 54 A.D. Uh, That's around the times of that journey. Um, We know that he came there. We know that he was forced out of the city through persecution. We read that story in the book of Acts, how the persecution in Thessalonica drove Paul uh, out of that city. Um, From there, he passed on to Berea and then to Athens. Um, And it's from Athens that we read Paul sending Timothy back to Thessalonica with Silas in order to encourage the the church there. Um, And from where Paul was, he went on to Corinth. And so it appears that when he was at Corinth, um, from the testimony of Acts and also from what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 3, uh, that Silas and Timothy returned with a report from a uh, city, from, uh, from Thessalonica. Remember that Silvanus is Silas's Roman name, so Silvanus and Silas are the same person. Um, so it seems that Timothy and Silas returned with a very encouraging report generally about the condition of the church in Thessalonica. And Paul writes... Um, to address some of the things he hears in the report. So spiritually, the church seems to be making very fine progress, and Paul's very encouraged uh, with the report that's brought to him. Um, Just as the Jews in Thessalonica had made life difficult for Paul, they were still making life difficult for the Christians, so they were suffering with persecution. It seems like the prejudice and hatred for the church was causing them to make negative insinuations about Paul's character and ministry. Uh, So Paul is going to write to defend himself in some ways. Um, Paul's influence for good is being undermined by these insinuations. He's going to write to want to correct that. Um, The opponents of Paul are also undermining the church's comfort in the gospel. Um, As church members are dying, people are beginning to ask the question, are they going to miss the glory of Christ's return? And in thinking about Christ's return, some people in the church are beginning to wonder, well, if Jesus is going to return soon, then what is the point of living our ordinary lives? Shouldn't we just basically sit around and wait for Jesus to come? Uh, How should we think about our lives as Christians in light of the uh, coming of Christ? Should we really keep toiling for things that perish? Um, Or should we just wait around for Jesus? Uh, So Paul's going to need to address that when he writes. Um, Paul wants to see them continue on the good path that they've begun. 
Um, he knows that they still have difficulties making a complete break with their heathen way of life, and so he's going to write uh, very carefully to say he's, that while he's encouraged with what's going on in the church, there still is a need for them to make a complete break from any heathen practices that still remain uh, in their lives to live the way that God would have them live. Um, and he also writes to encourage the leadership of the church. Uh, these would have been new leaders in a difficult situation in the church, and Paul wants to encourage the church, uh, both the officers of the church and for the welfare of the church as a whole. Uh, he writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 15, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do, do good to one another and to everyone. Uh, so Paul has several clear purposes in writing this letter. Uh, first, to express his gratitude for the good news that's come and to encourage them to continue on the progress they've made. Uh, second, to defend himself and his ministry against some of the accusations that have been made. You hear the beginnings of that defense already in what we read, that he says, you yourselves know how I was among you. Um, you hear the beginning of that defense, which he will expand on in this letter. Uh, third, he writes to emphasize and re-emphasize the need for a complete break from pagan ways of living, heathen lifestyle, uh, to live and serve Christ. Uh, fourth, he writes to strengthen the officers of the church and the, and the health of the church as a whole for how we all ought to relate to one another. Um, and finally, to expand and clarify his teaching on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, how that should be a comfort to God's people and how that should influence uh, how we live in this world. Um, and so that's going to be the general outline that Paul's going to follow as he, as he writes to the church and some of the things that he wants to cover. And it's a good reminder to us that a church can remain faithful even in the midst of persecution. Uh, even a church that started in the midst of persecution can still be something of a model for how to live. Paul says, you know, your, your example has sounded forth in the world. Um, the Macedonian churches were relatively poor churches. They were not uh, wealthy centers by and large. Um, they were known for, for having little but being very generous. Um, and so there's a lot we can learn from the Macedonian church. One of the great things about the book of First Thessalonians is it's a, it's a church that Paul is overall happy with. Um, a lot of the churches and the letters that we've read, there's a lot to be corrected in the church. Uh, there are a lot of churches that have a lot that they have to be corrected. And so this, this stands in stark contrast to a book like Galatians where the church is, is going well. But even a church that's going well has to be encouraged to continue to go well. Uh, to continue to do the things that they do well and to do those even better. And it's a reminder to us that even the best of churches still has significant areas where they could use improvement. Uh, the Thessalonian church was a model church in a lot of ways um, from the examples of churches we see in the New Testament. However, they still needed instructions about sexual purity. Uh, they still needed instructions about how to break from uh, the, the worldly ways of living around them. The church in their day struggled with that. The church in our day struggles with that. How to make a complete break from how the world says to live and how Christ says to live. Uh, we still struggle with that in our churches today. Um, and we have to be aware of that. Um, churches can be uh, inwardly and inwardly struggling and divided. Uh, Paul has to write them about how they relate to their church leaders, how they relate to one another. Um, it's another reminder that persecution and difficulty doesn't just come from outside the church. Uh, we can often do a lot to stir it up for ourselves. And this letter calls us uh, to think about how we can be mutually encouraging to one another, how we can be loving to one another, how we can seek to edify the church. And so this book has a lot of important things to say about how we relate to one another in the church, uh, members to officers, members to one another, um, all of those major things that churches need to know if they're going to live at peace with one another and be a bright and shining example to the world. So there's a lot of important things uh, that's to be considered in this book. Um, and one of the great reminders is how the gospel is the foundation of it all. Uh, that it's it's about how they received the gospel that will cause everything else to, to flow out from that in the life of the church. Um, and Paul doesn't want them to lose that, that connection, that vital connection to the gospel uh, that is the fountainhead of all good conduct. It's the fruit of faith that is produced in the life of Christians. And so it's from the gospel that the sanctification uh, then shines forth. Those who put their faith in Christ 
and then see the fruit of that faith in their lives. And so this is a wonderful little book of encouragement to a good church, and we can learn a lot from it, particularly about the Lord's coming again in glory. And we'll think a little bit more about that through the outline of the book. But let's thank God now for uh, this book together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know that uh, even the best of holiest of people make only a small beginning of the holiness that's required in this life. And likewise, even the best churches uh, still make only a beginning. We're thankful for this church and the example it is to us of, of how a church ought to be run, that uh, they glorified your name and encouraged your ministers. And so we're thankful for the church of Thessalonica and the lesson they can be for us. And we pray that we would apply the, the lessons that we learn in this book, that uh, the, the joy that the gospel creates, the steadfastness under trial that the gospel creates, the peace and unity and love that flow from uh, true faith, and that we might strive for these things as well, not only in our relation to the world around us, but in relation to our brothers and sisters in Christ. So we thank you for the great lessons of this book. We pray that you would help us to apply them with the strength of your Holy Spirit, that we might glorify your name and edify your church. So help us in these things, Lord. Help us cling to Christ no matter what we suffer, no matter what comes in this world. Watch over your church and keep her strong. Uh, continue to, to forgive our sins and sustain us with your help, we pray, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, people of God, it's been good to spend this time with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you until we meet again.